widows and orphans. The Lord protects those who are unable to defend themselves. Throughout the law are written protections for those who are unable to defend themselves. For example, in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 14, God instructs, and I quote, Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear thy God, I am the Lord. End quote. When you curse someone who is deaf, they're unable to hear and respond appropriately. Um, if you uh, slide an ottoman in front of a blind person as they're walking across their living room and watch them trip and fall and then laugh at them, I'm sure that our Father has a special punishment for people who would do such things. God includes widows and orphans on his list of those who have limited ability to defend themselves. I know the Lord has a special punishment for those who would mistreat widows or orphans. How do I know? Because it's written. Uh, open your Bibles as we begin our study to Exodus chapter 22, verse 7, as we begin our lesson today. And as always, we ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Chapter 22, the book of Exodus, verse 7, and it reads, <clears throat> excuse me, If a man shall deliver unto his neighbor money or stuff to keep, and it be stolen out of the man's house, if the thief be found, let him pay double. In other words, if the thief is caught in the act, he's required to pay double. Let's say he stole 30 shekels of silver, he would be required to repay 60 shekels of silver. Verse 8, But if the thief be not found, then the master of the house shall be brought unto the judges to see whether he hath put his hand unto his neighbor's goods. And of course, the homeowner uh, would some, be someone who was trusted by the person who left uh, goods in his uh, watch. And this coming before the judges, you could think of this uh, as those who were assigned to make decisions, and so often they were Levites or uh, even priests. And of course the priest, uh, if there was any question, could inquire of the Lord through the Urim and Thummim. Verse 9, For all manner of trespass, whether it be for ox, for ass, for sheep, for raiment, for clothing, or garments, or for any manner of lost thing, which another challengeth to be his, or declares that it's his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whom the judges shall condemn, he shall pay double unto his neighbor. And the word neighbor, uh, it is an associate, whether near or far. Not necessarily someone who lives next door, which is how we would commonly think of a neighbor. The word has also been translated in the King James Word Bible as brother. But the judges carried a lot of weight. Uh, and of course, uh, again, the judges, the priest, uh, would, could inquire of the Lord through the Urim and Thummim as to who was at guilt. Verse 10, If a man deliver unto his neighbor an ass, or an ox, or a sheep, or any beast to keep, and it die, or be hurt, or driven away, no man seeing it. In other words, if someone drove it off and there was no witness. Then shall an oath of the Lord be between them both. And a Lord, uh, an, an oath taken on the Lord's name was very, very serious. If you broke uh, your oath uh, on the Lord's name, the Lord would see that you would be punished. That he hath not put his hand unto his neighbor's goods. In other words, the person who was entrusted with his neighbor's goods didn't steal any of it himself. 
and the owner of it shall accept thereof, and he shall not make it good. No restitution would be necessary. And in this case, the person who left the goods under the uh, homeowner's watch believed him that he hadn't stolen uh, the, the goods based on his oath to the Lord in, or an oath that he hadn't in the Lord's name. Verse 12, And if it be stolen from him, he shall make restitution unto the owner thereof. In other words, the, the one who was entrusted with the goods was responsible for protecting his own home and his goods. And therefore, he would have to make restitution if he dropped his defenses and allowed his home to be broken into. And in that case, he would have to make restitution to the person who had entrusted his goods with him. Verse 13, another uh, example. If it be torn in pieces, in other words, if it were an ox, for example, that had been entrusted, and a lion came along and tore the ox in pieces for witness, and, and excuse me, then let him bring it, the carcass, in other words, that had been torn for witness, and he shall not make good that which was torn. No re restitution would be necessary in that case. Uh, things happen. Verse 14, And if a man borrow aught of his neighbor, and it be hurt or die, the owner thereof being not with it, he shall surely make it good. In other words, this he not being with it is referring to the owner not being with it. And what this means is that the, let's take the example of an ox again. In this case, if the owner had been with it, he, had been, he would have been hired uh, or rented the man and the ox. But in this case, he wasn't rented, he was borrowed, and therefore the borrower would be responsible for making restitution. Verse 15, but if the owner thereof be with it, if he was present, and again this means that he was hired, uh, he and the ox, to plow uh, the person's field, for example, he shall not make it good. If it be an hired thing, it came for his hire. In this case, the owner would not have to make restitution because if the ox, for example, uh, keeled over and died uh, from a heart attack uh, while plowing his field, but if he was hired to do so, it's still the owner of the ox's responsibility, not the person who hired the ox and the man. Verse 16, and if a man entice a maid, this word entice uh, is also translated to flatter or persuade, a maid that is not betrothed, that she's not uh, engaged or married, and lie with her, this is in sexual intercourse, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. This word endow means to bargain for uh, a wife, that is to say, to wed. And you know, in God's eyes, when a man spread his skirt, which is a Hebraism, a figure of speech, that means when a man lies with a, a woman, they're married in God's eyes. In fact, in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse eight, uh, the Lord spread his skirt over Jerusalem, meaning that he wed Jerusalem. Verse 17, if her father utterly refused to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. And the dowry of virgins is laid out in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 29. And the dowry of the virgins, the amount, <coughs> excuse me, was 50 shekels of silver. Verse 18, the law of God. Thou shalt not suffer or allow a witch to live. And a witch we often think of as a woman, uh, not necessarily the case. It has no gender implied here. It can be a woman or a man, and it refers to anyone who uh, might whisper a spell or practice magic. Whosoever lieth with a beast 
shall surely be put to death. Bestiality is not natural. God had no plans for people to practice bestiality just as he had no plans for people to practice homosexuality. The punishment for bestiality, uh, capital punishment, death. Verse 20, he that sacrificeth unto God, uh, any God, small g, save or accept unto the Lord only, Yahweh only, he shall be utterly destroyed. This is how false religion gets started. And, you know, your, fa your heavenly father is jealous. Uh, Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, God says, you'll have no other gods before me. My name is Jealous. And that's Jealous with a capital J. Verse 21, thou shalt neither vex, and that means to mistreat, a stranger, that's a foreigner, nor oppress him, for ye were strangers or foreigners in the land of Egypt. For 400 years, you were foreigners in bondage in the land of Egypt. So I don't want you mistreating uh, foreigners because I didn't allow you to be mistreated uh, to any great extent while you were in bondage in Egypt. Verse 22, you shall not afflict, this means to take advantage of, any widow or fatherless child, an orphan in other words. Again, God protects those who are unable to defend themselves. He takes it very, very seriously. How seriously does he take someone who would take advantage of a widow or fatherless child, an orphan? Listen up. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. And there's a lesson in this for you widows and orphans. If you're being oppressed by someone, what should you do? You should cry unto the Lord, and he will hear, and he will respond. How will he respond? Verse 24. And my wrath, the Lord speaking, shall wax hot, will become or grow hot, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows and your children fatherless. Just as the widows and orphans who you were mistreating, I'm going to make it to where your wives become widows because you're dead. I'm going to make sure that your children are fatherless. Why? Because again, I'm going to kill you with the sword. To take advantage of widows and orphans in court is also forbidden by God's law. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 14. Deuteronomy chapter four, uh, 24, excuse me. We're going to pick it up with chapter 14. Deuteronomy 24, 14. And it reads, the law of God. Thou shalt not oppress, this means to defraud, an hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren, of Israel in other words, uh, or of thy strangers, the foreigners that reside among you, that are in thy land within thy gates. And what this is talking about is if you hire a day laborer, you're responsible for reimbursing his labor. Uh, he, he performed the task that you required of him, now you're required to make payment. Verse 15, at his day thou shalt give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it. The very day that the work is done, you're paying the person who did it. For he is poor and setteth his heart upon it. This means he, he wants his wages. He earned them. He, he's entitled to them. Lest he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. In James chapter 5 verse 4, very explicitly states that if you withhold the wages of a day laborer, then he cries out to the Lord 
that the Lord of Sabaoth, which means the Lord of hosts, will hear it. And then the person who withheld the wages is accountable for the sin. The fathers shall not be put to death for the children. Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. And we're talking about sins here. The children are not, are not going to be held accountable for the parents' sins. The parents aren't accountable for the children's sins. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. On judgment day, there will be no one standing between you and your heavenly Father, and you will be held accountable for the sins that you have not repented of. Now some read Exodus chapter 20, verses 5 and 6, where we find <clears throat> the Ten Commandments written. And they read there that the sins of the uh, ancestors will be carried out to the third and fourth generation. And then they quit reading. And they think that, that they read that, that the children are going to be held accountable for the sins of their elders to the third and fourth generation. That's not what it says in Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5 and 6, I'll continue. It states there that the sins of the ancestors will be carried out to the third and fourth generation to those who hate me. In other words, their children, the generations following, continue in the sins of their ancestors. And that only makes sense. They're going to be held accountable for those sins just like their ancestors. Why? Because they're committing the same sins that their ancestors. But then it continues in Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, but show, got the Lord showing mercy to those who love Him. So if the children correct their ways and start loving the Lord and serving Him, they're not going to be held accountable for the sins of their ancestors. Verse 17, Thou shalt not pervert the judgment. Now this is talking about in court of the stranger, the foreigner, nor of the fatherless, the orphan, nor take a widow's raiment in pledge. This word in pledge is to bind. In other words, you won't take a widow's article of clothing uh, to bind her to a debt, in other words. God protects those who are unable to protect themselves. But thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman, a slave in Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee thence. He ransomed you. Therefore I command thee to do this thing. You're not going to bind the widow with a pledge when I, the Lord speaking, set you free when you were bound uh, in Egypt. I set you free, don't you bind others and especially widows or orphans. When thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, and hast forgot a sheaf, the sheaf is a, a bundle actually in the Hebrew, a heap or an omer, in the field thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, for the orphans, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand. Now this doesn't just necessarily, and of course what this is saying is, if you overlook uh, some of your harvest, don't go back with a fine tooth comb, leave it for the foreigner, uh, for the, the orphan, for the widow. And this doesn't necessarily apply only to agriculture. Uh, yes, the Lord will bless you if you do this in an agricultural sense, but let's say, for example, you're, you, you're, you are a mechanic. You, you work in auto repair, and a widow comes into your shop, and you know that she's a widow. It was in her, the paper last week that her husband passed away, or last month, and you know that she has fallen on financial hard times. I mean, she's gone from having a breadwinner to not having a breadwinner. And then if you as an auto repairman 
uh, see that her need and you take care of it and then offer her a, a significant discount or if you're able, do it for free, God is going to reward the work of your hands in the future. He's going to bless you, in other words. If you want your labors blessed, uh, treat widows and orphans well. Verse 20, when thou beatest thine olive tree, you know, what this is talking about is when olives were ripe, uh, the, the tenders would take the, a branch of a large stick and beat the limbs of the olive tree. And if the olives were ripe, they would fall from the tree to the ground when there they would be picked up. Thou shalt not go over the boughs again. In other words, you won't go back and beat the boughs again to get more uh, olives. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. All produce from the land is a blessing of God. Uh, if not for God, we would have nothing, much less enough to share those, with those who are in need. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. You go over uh, the, the vines once, uh, harvesting the grapes, but don't go back a second time. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And thou shalt remember that thou was a bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore I command thee to do this thing. There was a widow that had a serious problem that Elisha helped out of a bind. Let's go to 2 Kings as we continue our study on widows and orphans. 2 Kings, we're looking for chapter 4, verse 1. Now, of course, Elisha took up the mantle of Elijah, and he asked for a double portion of God's Spirit. Elijah performed eight miracles. Elisha performed 16 miracles in God's Word. A double portion he asked a double portion he received. In chapter 4, we see one of the miracles that Elisha performed. Chapter 4, 2 Kings, verse 1, and it reads, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets. Now, the sons of the prophets meant that they were students of either Elijah or Elisha, in this case, the latter sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And this woman is now a widow. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. You, you knew he was a student of the Lord, but why? He was in your school. He was a good man. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. There's a debt in, incurred and not able to be repaid. And the creditor, uh, by law, had the right to take her sons as bondmen. Why? Because he had not been paid. Verse 2. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Question. Tell me, what hast thou in the house? What, what do I have to work with here? And she said, Thine handmaid hath nothing, excuse me, hath not anything in the house save or except a pot of oil. This word pot in the Hebrew is asuk. Uh, and it means uh, smearing or an anointing flask of oil. We're talking about a small vial uh, of oil. And then he, Elisha, said, Go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. Borrow as many empty vessels, large vessels, as you can acquire. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. I don't want you making this miracle to be a spectacle. Uh, I don't want 
you to make this miracle a circus sideshow and shalt pour out un, into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. I want you to take the small flask of anointing oil that you had in your home and I want you to start filling the larger vessels with oil. And when the one larger vessel is full, set it aside and get another large vessel and continue pouring out of the small flask. That's the miracle that the oil in the small flask did not cease until all of the larger vessels were full. You keep pouring. Verse 5. So she went from him and shut the door upon her, following his instructions, and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out, began to follow Elijah's instructions. Oil, olive oil in particular, very important in God's word. James chapter 5, verse 14. We learn that if any of you are sick or ill, come before the elders and request an anointing. And what is the olive oil? Uh, Christ is Christos, the anointed one. And we use oil not because the oil does the healing, but we use the oil in obedience to the instructions of our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ as well. Also important that you realize that oil was a valuable commodity at this time. Uh, King Solomon uh, traded, one of the things he traded to Hiram, who supplied a lot of the building materials for Solomon's voracious building appetite, the temple of God, Solomon's own house, uh, Pharaoh's daughter's house, uh, the, uh, the, the forest of Lebanon, and on goes the list and list. But one of the things that Solomon traded Hiram for building materials was oil, olive oil. Verse 6, And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet another vessel. The oil's still coming. Bring another vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. The oil stopped. Uh, God in control. Now, did Elisha cause this oil not to cease flowing from this small flask and enough to fill all of the large vessels they were able to borrow? No, it wasn't Elisha's power. It was the power of our Heavenly Father. Verse 7, Then she came and told the man of God, Elisha, and he said, Go sell the oil. It was valuable. And pay the debt to the creditor. And it's mentioned in verse 1. And live thou and thy children of the rest. God takes care of those who are unable to defend themselves, especially widows and orphans. The Lord protects widows and orphans as well. Turn with me to Psalm 146 as we continue our study this morning. Psalm 146, let's pick it up with verse 1. Uh, this is the first of five hallelujah psalms. In fact, these are the last five psalms of the book of Psalms, but they all have a unique feature. They all begin with praise ye the Lord and end with praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord in the Hebrew language, hallelujah. Psalm 146, verse 1, and it reads, Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Twice for emphasis. While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. While I'm alive, I will continue to praise the Lord. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. I don't care how good a man is, Men will always eventually let you down. You can't put your confidence for your eternal life in man. 
Oh, sure, man will tell you we well, have cryogenics, we'll, we'll freeze you until science uh, advances enough that we can bring you back to life. Uh, we can clone you. Hasn't happened yet, and it won't happen. The only way for you to find eternal life is for you to find your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is only one salvation. It is the Lord's. His, referring to man's, breath goeth forth, ruach in the Hebrew. He returneth to his earth. Uh, from earth, God scooped up and formed Adam, a uh, man of the dust. Uh, that's where the term dust to dust, ashes to ashes comes from. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5 states, The dead knoweth not anything. And of course, what we're talking about here in this verse is your flesh. Your flesh does go back to the earth when you die. As we learn in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, Ere the silver cord ever be part, that's a Hebraism that means when we die, uh, the flesh returns to the earth from which it came, the spirit returns to the Father from whence it came. Verse 5, Happy or blessed is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help. The God of Jacob is your help as well, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Genesis chapter 28, God met Jacob. Jacob had nothing nor deserved anything, but was promised everything. Verse 6, which made heaven and earth, the sea and all that therein is. Those are the words of true worship, which keepeth truth forever. Another reference to the book of Genesis. Uh, God is forever consistent. Man continually changes. Which executeth judgment for the oppressed. He, he makes justice to the oppressed which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseth the prisoners. Second Peter chapter 3, one of the first things that Jesus did after the crucifixion, he went to the prisoners and he preached to them the gospel, the good news. Many of them believed. Don't be a prisoner to the world. Truth has been opened to your eyes and your spiritual eyes are wide open. Verse 8, the Lord openeth the eyes of the blind, even the spiritually blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. There was someone else who promised that your eyes would be opened. Uh, he was the devil, the serpent. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, Eve told the serpent, The Lord told us, don't partake of that tree that stands in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The devil said, if you partake of that tree, you won't die. That was a lie. He said, but your eyes will be opened and you will be as God's. There's only one who can open your spiritual eyes, that's your heavenly Father. Verse 9, the reason we came here, the Lord preserveth, this word in the Hebrew is shamar, a word many of you are familiar with, the strangers, the foreigners. He relieveth the fatherless, the orphans, and widow, but the way of the wicked he turneth upside down. The wicked try to turn things upside down themselves. They say what's wrong is right and what's right is wrong. The Lord is going to turn them upside down. Back to this word preserveth, shamar in the Hebrew. It means to hedge about or to guard. It's like God puts a wall of protection around the foreigners, the orphans, and the widows. The Lord shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, will you serve Yahweh, who reigns forever? 
Or will you serve the Antichrist who has a date with the lake of fire? Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. I'll quote the words of Joshua. You can do whatever you want, I'm paraphrasing. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The scribes and Pharisees were treating, were not treating widows right. Turn with me. Jesus called them out for it. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Let's go with verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples. Now, sometimes Jesus took his disciples to the side. And that meant that not everyone was meant to hear. In this case, the multitude was meant to hear and understand, as well as you. Verse 2. Saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Who was Moses? Well, Moses was the lawgiver. The scribes and Pharisees have moved right in and taken over the lawgiver's seat. And who are the scribes? Well, make a note of 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55. The Kenites, K-E-N-I-T-E-S, had already worked their way in that early on as scribes for the tribe of Judah. Verse 3. All, therefore, whatsoever they, the scribes and Pharisees, bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. The scribes and Pharisees aren't practicing what they're preaching, is what this is saying. And some people say, well, this is Jesus instructing us to do what the scribes and Pharisees. You've got, if you have a companion Bible, read Bullinger's note that states this is not a command as the whole chapter is a renunciation of what the scribes and Pharisees do. Verse 4, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. They lay burdens that bind people, but they won't even lift their little finger to carry one of the burdens themselves. John chapter 8, verse 32. Jesus says there that the truth, know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth, God's word, does not bind you. Don't allow any scribe or Pharisee or preacher try to bind you with the word of God. It sets you free. Verse 5. But all their works, this is the scribes and Pharisees, they do for to be seen of men. They're off on an ego trip, uh, one-upmanship. Uh, this is how the traditions of men uh, came about. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. The borders were the fringes that they attached to the, the bottom of, the, of a robe or a cloak. Phylacteries, they're also known as frontlets. And there were two, actually. One was a leather box that they attached to their forehead with a strap around their head. And another was in one they carried in their hand, which had a long leather strap on it, which they wrapped around their arm many times. These boxes carried four scriptures. Uh, Exodus chapter 13, verses 2 through 10, or the first set. The second set, Exodus 13, verses 11 through 17. Also Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, and Deuteronomy 11, verses 13 through 23. The purpose of the phylacteries was to keep the Word of God close to our mind and also to our hands with what we work and what we do things for the Lord. 
But these guys were off making a big show out of their religion, trying to be holier than thou, verse 6, and loved the uppermost rooms at feasts. They loved the most honorable seats at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. They even took the seat of Moses in uh, verse 2. And greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Uh, and, and of course, you might hear today, they like to be called reverend. Don't revere man, revere your heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. But be not ye called Rabbi or Master, for one is your master, even Christ, all ye are brethren. Don't revere each other, don't revere man, revere Christ. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. There's only one heavenly father, and he created your very soul. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Don't reverence yourself or any other man. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Christ washed the feet of the disciples. He served all of us by, being, by dying on the cross when they crucified him for our sins. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased or brought low. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. That's just the way it is. Now, beginning in verse 13, we come to the eight woes that correspond with the eight uh, blessed of the Beatitudes you'll find in Matthew chapter 5. If you have a companion Bible, you have an appendix 126 that compares the uh, eight Beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5 with the eight woes of Matthew chapter 23. But woe, this is the first of the woes, unto you scribes and Pharisee, hypocrites, this word hypocrites means stage actors. You're phony, you're pretending, you're playing like you're in a play. For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves into the kingdom of heaven, neither suffer or allow ye them that are entering to go in. You not only enter the kingdom of heaven yourself, you prevent others from going in. That, that's what Satan wants. Satan doesn't want God's children to enter the kingdom of heaven. He wants uh, company in the lake of fire. Woe, this is two, unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, this means an outward showing, make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation, or abundant damnation. They're taking away the homes of widows, probably for their own financial benefit, making the widow homeless. Now, do you, if, if taking a woman or causing a widow's garment to be bound in a court system, how much more do you think it would anger your heavenly father if they took her whole home and made her homeless? Woe, this is the third, unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land, you travel the world over to make one proselyte, which is a convert, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. You travel the world to make one convert. Then once you make that one conversion, you make them two times more likely to enter hell than you are. That convert would have been better had you left them alone. Woe, the fourth, unto you, ye blind guides, the blind leading the blind, which say, whosoever shall swear by the temple, in other words, to take an oath on the temple, it is nothing, it's not binding. 
But whosoever shall swear or make an oath by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. He is bound if he took his oath on the gold. Now let me ask you, what's the temple in the eternity? Well, we learn in the book of Revelation that the temple of the eternity is uh, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. So what they're doing is taking and making it binding if you take an oath on gold more so than if you take an oath on the temple. Verse 17, Jesus continues, Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. The temple, of course, is uh, more important than the gold. Christ is our salvation. If you think gold is going to save you and give you eternal life, you've got a lot to learn. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. They, they teach, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. He is a debtor or bound by it. Now, remember again, uh, all of this is what the scribes and Pharisees say. And this whole chapter is Jesus' renunciation for what they do. Verse 19, Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. The, anchor, the altar sanctifies the gift, not vice versa. The gift being a tithe, if you will. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, meaning the gift or the, uh, the tithe, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. He that shall swear by heaven sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. And I, for one, don't recommend you do that. Um, Jesus would teach in one point, uh, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. You don't need to start swearing upon the throne of God. That's dangerous. Verse 23, woe, this is the fifth Unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. You count every leaf of the tithe. In other words, that's what's important to you. But... You're not teaching people the weightier matters of the law, which is more important than the tithe. If you're listening to a preacher that all he talks about is the tithe and the offerings and the money, where is his heart and his mind? It's on the money. Don't support beggars. 24, ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. This is saying that you, you, you go to great lengths to strain a gnat out of the wine, but then you turn around and swallow a camel. That makes no sense. Woe, this is six, unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. In other words, you try and spruce yourselves up and look holy and clean, but inside you're unclean. And it's more important that you be clean inside than to have the appearance of being clean to deceive others. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first that which is within, the inner man, the cup and platter, uh, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe, this is seven, unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres. You're like whitewashed buildings, which indeed appear beautiful outward. The outside looks good, 
but are within full of dead men's bones, spiritually dead, you could think of, and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. You try and look holy, but you're deceiving people and leading them away from God's word. 29, woe, this is 8. Unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. You, you act so holy and garnish, or, or that means to dress up the sepulchres of the prophets with flowers. Okay, the thought continues, verse 30. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Oh, yes, they would. Their fathers, the Kenites, slew many of the prophets. They, these Kenites, the scribes and Pharisees, crucified Jesus Christ. They certainly were just as guilty in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witness unto yourselves that ye are children of them which killed the prophets. Children of those who killed the prophets. The Kenites killed the prophets. The Kenites is who he's addressing here. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. You're going to receive the same measure of punishment and the cup of God's wrath as your ancestors. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Well, there's only one way they can escape the damnation of hell, and it's, that's for them to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. According to Paul, widows were to be cared for by their families. Uh, if there was no family, then the church was to take care of them. Turn with me quickly as we conclude 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is instruction to pastors as to how to run a church. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. Respect the elders and the younger men as brethren. Don't, don't castigate members of your congregation in front of the whole congregation. You treat them as with respect. The elder woman as mothers, uh, the younger as sisters with all purity. And when you come into this building, this congregation, you feel loved. Why? Because we all treat each other as family. We are family. We're brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Honor widows that are widows indeed. This means to value or revere widows. The word indeed means of a truth. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, to, to repay their family. You know, your, your parents raised you when they need help and become older. You should be willing to help them. For that is good and acceptable before God. God will honor that and look upon it with respect. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate, this means that is bereaved, has lost, trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day for the body of the church, the body of Christ. But she, the widow, that liveth in pleasure, uh, and this is self-indulgent, is dead, spiritually dead, uh, while she liveth. And these things give in charge, or these are the rules, that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, his own family, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel, worse than an unbeliever, if you will. And those of you who have, you know, men, you can divorce your spouse, but you cannot divorce your children. Uh, 
that you brought them into the world, you're responsible. Pay your child support. Let not a widow be taken into the number, the, to the church list of widows is what this is talking about. Under three score years old. If they're younger than 60 years old, they're not to be taken into the church list of widows, having been the wife of one man. Well reported of for good. Now this is talking about those who are over 60. Uh, for good works. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently, diligently followed every good work. She was a good woman, compassionate. In that case, take her into the list of widows that the church is going to care for. But the younger widows, those who are under 60 years old, refuse. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. When those uh, hormones start flowing again and they get over the loss of their previous husband, they start looking around and want to remarry. Having damnation because they have cast off their first faith because they needed a mate, in other words. In other words, don't let them make a commitment to Jesus Christ if they're not 60 years old or older. Because if they're younger, they're liable to start looking around and want another mate. Verse 13, And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house today by telephone or internet, and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry. It's better for the widows who are younger than 60 to remarry, bear children, guide the house, give none non occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after Satan. If any man or woman that believeth have widows in their family, in other words, let them relieve them. And let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Those who don't have family, the widows, the church will take care of. But if you have a widow in your family, you're responsible for her. Verse 17, to conclude, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And you know, that's what God's elect receive a double portion of blessings and reward. Don't take advantage of orphans and widows. If you want to get on God's bad side, that's a very quick way to do it. If you're able, help widows and orphans. Uh, if you want blessings from your heavenly Father, if you want Him to bless uh, your labors, let's go to His throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word, Father, your word that tells us how to be pleasing to you, Father. We thank you for the law. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Let everything that we do the rest of this day be a reflection of the love that is Jesus Christ. In Jesus' precious name, amen.